Hey YouTube, what's going on? We continue doing a revision related to electrostatics. So it's all about static charges and static electricity. And it's right time to figure out and find out where and under which circumstances their specific system is of charges is in equilibrium. In other words, the problem is pretty simple. You'll be given two charges set up in specific points and you need to put the third charge so that all three charges will experience basically their resultant force equals to zero. Okay, let's have a look at this problem. Grab your pens, grab your notes as always, try to do by your own. And here's the right time to understand how this works. So, okay, let's have a look. First of all, I want to notice that if you have two charges set up in specific points and let's mark them as here is the Q1 and here is the Q2 and we understand that because we have position vectors R1 and R2 so it means those vectors that comes from the origin to the given points so we can actually set up the straight line connecting those two charges Q1 and Q2 and this way. Because they are both positives, okay, they're both positives, obviously Q, the capital Q, the new third charge that we need to put somewhere under position vector R at some point should be negative. That's obviously for the balance because if it's going to be positive, all three charges Will be will repel each other and that means there wouldn't be any balance in this case so that's why we establish the sign of the charge q it's going to be negative and due to the fact of the uh, two positive charges at both ends we need to put this charge q somewhere on this line connecting those two charges q1 and q2 but we don't know the given the exact point and exact position. So that's why if I marked R1 as position vector for Q1 and R2 as the position vector for Q2, so we can put charge Q somewhere defined by the position vector R3. Okay, I just remind you one more time, the position vector always starts in the origin and point to the given point where your particle, charge particle, is uh, situated. So that's why I put it this way. Of course, for this approach, we'll, uh, so for, for to solve, to find out their given position, R3 of charge Q and the value of charge Q itself, we need to apply um, Obviously, the second Newton's law about uh, that there is no motion, there is no acceleration, and all charges are in equilibrium. <clears throat> so that's why for points where Q1 is or Q or Q2 is, we can apply the second Newton's law. And because for even for every given charge, for example, Q1, there will be two interactions from the side of capital Q, unknown charge, and from the side of Q2, okay? So that's why we can, for example, take a position at Q, defined by a position vector R3, and try to write the balance, for example, interaction between Q1 and Q, and Q2 and Q itself, okay? So that's why force of interaction from side of charge Q1 is going to be equal to the force that acts from the point of where Q2 is. However, I'm not going to apply the vector way, so you can resolve this problem through the column formula, right? That can be written in, in the vector way, in this way, 1 over phi, 4 pi epsilon 0. For example, let's consider interaction Q1 and Q, so that's why it's going to be force F1. And we can put Q1 and Q over there, basically the distance between two charges, which is in this case, for example, interaction um, in the way 
like this. So that's going to be the vector, which is simply R1 minus R3 in this case. So we raise this vector in power 3 and multiply by the same difference. So R1 minus R3. Okay, so here is the way, but it's much easier to solve this problem through the coordinate approach because we need to find position vector r um, that point to q, okay? But uh, it's better to decompose by components. So that's why, that's why we need to actually to put, to decompose vector r3 into the following components. So x3 and y3. And for each, for each charge, we can do the same. Instead of R1 and R2, we can write down the components. So that's why it's better to write down the coordinates and this way. So that's going to be X1, X, sorry, uh, X1, Y1. So here is going to be X3 and Y3 for the third charge. And here is going to be X2 and y2 and write down for example the expression uh, for x components so basically make projection of all the forces along x direction and then all forces along y direction but once we've established the equation for x components we can do in a similar way to the y with respect to y because that's going to be identical expression so what we're going to do in this case, let's set up at position Q this equation, but with respect to X components. So right now, we uh, try to balance the force F1 and F2 of interaction. So in this way, but we'll write uh, in the way of components, X components. So that's why the force F1, which is the force representing interaction of Q1 and Q, will be written as the phone. So the product over the difference of the coordinates. So in this case, X3 minus X1 squared. Okay, that's going to be the difference of coordinates. Hence, you, you define the sort of x difference of the distance yeah x component of the distance between charges q1 and q and of course we will write we need to write coefficient k which represent one or four pi epsilon so the right side will represent interaction of q and q2 so that's why we can write q2 times again q over the difference of coordinates in this case it's going to be x2 minus x3 squared x2 minus x3 squared. All right, so what we can do, we can simplify that. But before we're doing, we need to evaluate square root of both parts. So that's why we'll get square root of q1 over x3 minus x1. Uh, I'm not going to write the absolute values because obviously, according to our reference frame and our coordinates of system, so x3 is going to be more than x1, right? So that's why we'll put x3 minus x1. So we just expand the absolute value in this case. And what about q2? So we'll get interaction of q2 and q as the square root of q2 and the same x2 minus x3 because it's 2 is greater. Because obviously we need to have both parts positive in this case or both parts negative otherwise it won't work right because square root of each charge is going to be uh, positive values and they're both positive so that's okay so now we can express x3 coordinates from here and if you write that you'll get the following so x2 square root of q1 plus x1 square root of q2 and over square root of q1 plus square root of q2. And that's going to be the final expression for 
x3 component. What about y3 component? That's going to be the same, right? That's going to be definitely the same because uh, we'll get similar exp expression to for y components and a similar way y1 squared of q2 and over square root of q1 plus square root of q2. As you can see, there is the identical structure for y component uh, as for x components. Now, what we can do in order to get, so basically we've got the expression for uh, R3 because we identify components through the components of vectors R1 and R2. Because once we are given vector R1 and R2, either we're given uh, the absolute value, right, and angle at which it goes. So, I mean, this angle, for example, right? Or we given the set of coordinates x1 and x2, uh, x1 and y1 and x2 and y2 correspondingly. So that's why we've got expression for the coordinates of the position vector that points to the charge Q, okay? So now the rest part is to identify the charge value. As we establish, it's gonna be negative. So let's move on to the next slide. And here, before we go on there, so we will establish the interaction, let's say at point Q1, for example. If we take interaction of charges at point where Q1 is situated, so we can write interaction of Q1 and Q, and Q1 and Q2 respectively. So that's why at point basically identified by the coordinates x1 and y1, where Q1 is, we can set up again the balance equation for forces. So that's why we simply put interaction of Q1 and Q2, in our case, over, so one more time, the distance Q1 and Q2 is going to be the difference between X2 and X1. So over X2 minus X1 squared. And the right side is going to be about interaction of Q1 and Q. So that's why we will put Q one more time. So it's going to be Q1 and Q itself. Okay. So over x3 minus x1 squared. So here I don't put the minus sign so because I use the absolute value for that but bear in mind that q is going to be negative finally. Okay. So right now it's positive so actually if you want to take into account the charge of q so we need to put a minus sign. Okay. And indeed so the interaction force between q1 and q is going to be directed towards Q, so this way around, while interaction force between Q2 and Q1 will be directed again X axis generally. So that's why actually here is going to be a minus sign. All right, so this is done. And finally, we can write, we can take the square root of both parts, but you're not eligible to take the square root of negative signs. So that's why one more time, I'll use the absolute value, okay? Or it's, it's better, right? It's better to use the negative, uh, the, the absolute value for Q. In this case, bear in mind that Q finally should be negative. Okay, let's take the square root of both parts. So we'll get Q1 and Q2. Basically by Q1 can be canceled. So we'll get square root of Q2 over x2 minus x1 and that's going to be equal to square root of q and you can put all this stuff however yeah i think we're not going to take the square root because finally we need to find a value for q so let let live as it is okay so just express the q value from here so q value is going to be equal to q2 times x3 minus x1 squared and over x2 minus x1 squared. Bear in mind that q is going to be negative. So if you want, I can put the minus sign before to make sure you don't miss it in the end. 
and we put expression for x3 right now inside so we'll get minus q2 and instead of x3 we'll put the following so x2 the expression that we've already got q2 and over square root of q1 plus square root of q2 and minus but i just go to the common denominator and that's why it's going to be minus x1 square root of q1 minus x1 square root of q2 everything is going to be in square including the bottom part and we divide basically by x2 minus x2 minus x1 all right which is also squared and have a look here we can cancel those two terms because they're the same value but opposite signs and we can even more factorize square root of q1 and once it's factorized we'll get the following it's going to be minus q2 times q1 because we raised to, to the power of 2 and x2 minus x1 will be cancelled because we'll, we'll be left with x2 minus x1 after factorizing square root of q1 and here is the bottom part is going to be over x2 minus x1 squared so we we've cancelled them and we'll stay with square root of q1 plus square root of q2 and to the power of 2. all right so that's going to be the final expression for our charge that we need to put somewhere on the line connecting two charges q1 and q2 and uh, we also define the coordinates of the position vector that it points to our charge q all right so i hope you got this approach but one more time so you can use a vector approach instead of coordinates instead of breaking down by coordinates and you'll get the same expression but uh, in terms of r1 and r uh, and r2 actually the vectors that we're given okay so that was complete explanation for this problem i hope that uh, in the case you'll get very similar problem maybe with more charges you'll pro you you'll apply the same approach that i use here the balance methods just basically it's described by the resulting force to be equal to zero and hence you're eligible to set up the second newton's law for that all right and it can be applicable to um, any amount of charges you're given given in a specific problem okay and any geometry so it's more about geometry than physics actually <laughs> all right so hope you like that don't forget to subscribe if you're new here smash the like button and share your comments see you next time